Amit. Thank you very much. I, it's very nice to be invited to this conference, and I, I have to admit I, I should speak at, le at least a little bit of Swedish, but I, I do not. My, my uncle was married to a Swede. My father spoke fluently Swedish. My brother did a little bit, and uh, my family is spending summer time for, I think, more than 15 years now in the Swedish Fjell, and my daughters more or less grew up there, walking in the Fjell, but my Swedish is very, very poor, so I think it's better to do this, this in English. And, uh, well, my personal his history concerning uh, snub-nosed dog breeds, I started with respiratory surgery in these breeds, meanwhile, 25 years ago. And 12, 13 years ago, um, we founded a specialized group at our university doing ENT stuff, ear, nose, and throat. And we're doing, we are, meanwhile, we are five wets only doing ear, nose, and throat diseases. And we are mainly specialized in endoscopic surgery. So <clears throat> this is... This is um, the place where I'm working, and I want to, well, go. I just was told we have a few minutes more, so I don't have to hurry that, that much. Um, I want to walk with you through more or less experiences and new knowledge that we brought together during the last 10 to 12 years. Um, to give a short overview, I want to start with embryology, how, how we started out in life and how our dogs did, uh, we all did that snub-nosed. And um, then we have to go a little bit into the literature and um, you will drive home today realizing that there was a big lie in that fairy tale that your parents told you many years ago. Um, Little Red Riding Hood in English. And then I want to take you away down from the tip of the nose down to the bronchi to show you videos of some of the most common obstruction. And um, I also want to look together with you a little bit around breathing problems, what is important also. We already had, so, had some information on that. And um, well, there are, I could spend hours on different treating models. Uh, I think I, I, I just concentrated on a very, a, a few new ones. And um, well, to start what was pointed out so importantly in the morning, to start any dialogue, uh, I, I also want to, to close with some suggestion from my perspective. So let's start from the very first day of uh, animals and man and the, the um, well-known information is that we all started snub-nosed, even the birds. And uh, it is amazing how this middle face grows when becoming adult. So if we look at the pictures and we see that the, it is mainly this part of the skull that is growing after birth when we start to chew, this is something that induces the length, um, the, the middle face to become longer and in man, in humans, brachycephaly is defined as a hereditary growth inhibition. So this does not take place in humans which have this hereditary disease. If we look at the turbinates, not at the outer frame of the nose, but what is inside the nose, even the turbinates are very small after birth. And if we look from, oh, 
this was too fast. It, we, we do see a lot of space here, and we also do, do see that here. And if we then look at the same nose, or not at the same nose, but at the same, same situation, in the adult animal, we see there is no space left. It's totally filled out the whole nasal cavity with a very, very filigrane structure. I'll show you later on uh, an example of how this looks in our noses and how much easier we are built. So there must be, this is, this is one first information, even the turbinates, not only the middle face is smaller after birth, but even the turbinates immediately after birth are very small. And then they start to grow. And a very important question is, what tells them to stop growing? There's no light in the nose and they grow till they are very close to the next structure, but they never touch it. It's a very complicated structure, but none of these mucosal parts touch, touches the other one. So, first question is, why do dogs need long noses? And uh, scientists always have to go back to the literature. And uh, if we do that, and we look in the old textbooks, we see the fairy tale of Red, Little Red Riding Hood. And I was told it, it, it is not in all the Swedish texts, but in the, let me say, the other fairy tale texts in Europe. There is that question the girl asked to the wolf. Why do you have such a long nose? What a long nose you have. And then there is an answer from the wolf. And this is actually the lie. The rest in the fairy tale is true, definitely. But there's a lie. The answer was that this was the question. I hope I got it right. And this was the answer. That I can smell you better. And this is the lie. Because dogs do not have a long nose for smelling. So let me explain this in the next minutes. It's a, dogs' noses are very complicated structures, not comparable with ours. And you see many different parts with different tasks. And I want to take you in a few sentences through this anatomical structure. And we start at the, at the entrance. And the entrance is pure distribution. There is a certain mechanism that makes the air either stream up there or down there. This is a drawing from a human nose with a thumb like this. And you see, we are built very easy, very easy structured. And I'm the speaker. I'm allowed to do that. I can put my finger in the nose very easy. I cleaned it very good this morning. <laughs> Our dogs can't do that because there is a huge bulb, a vestibular bulb that is designed to distribute the in-streaming air into certain areas. And as you see here at the CT slide, slice, it goes even in the lateral part. We, we don't have that. And this structure, you see, there's behind this bulb, there is a hole, there's a recess. And what we, I want to do with you is to circle one time around with the endoscope around this bulb into this recess. When we are in, circled around one time, we see very, very tough folds with the cartilage inside, and they have the task to direct the in-streaming air into this meatus, into this canal, 
And when we follow this airstream, we discover a little hole there. And to demonstrate that, that this is a hole, I put in a little metal probe. So this is the opening of a duct. And further caudally, there is a gland called the lateral nasal gland that is producing fluid. The fluid is dripping down here into this gutter on the roof uh, where the rain is drained into this gutter and then running caudally, still a bit. I think it's running better now, and it's running over the whole ventral conca, and all this moisture here is more or less, not all, but most of the moisture there is produced from this gland and is running over this structure. So we can go back to so this one. So we have looked at this area, and now this is the, for me, the most, the most important area in a dog's nose, which, which is the most different to our situation. That's the area of thermoregulation. So. We have, in the dog's nose, we have a gland. Somebody in 1600 and something discovered this gland. And there is a duct starting in the gland, running rostrally. There we had the metal probe in this hole. And from there, the fluid is running caudally through this gutter and makes the whole ventral conca wet. But this alone does not produce enough cold. It's just wet. And if you have in mind your last swimming, probably not yesterday, but last summer, standing alongside the, the um, lake, when the wind is coming and you are wet from swimming, this produces the cold. So one time again, this, if the wind is coming and going over this moist area, it produces vaporization and makes it cold. And from here, there are blood vessels to the brain without any valves, and this is cooling the brain. So this is the most important situation for the dog to cool down, to get rid of his, his uh, calories. If, if we are running, we are sweating. If a horse is running, the horse is sweating. Dogs have no sweat glands. Dogs produce their cold in this, in this uh, system. It's very, very unique for, for certain animals. So, Again, if we compare this, this was the situation, the drawing, this is the CT, and we compare this with the situation in man. This little sausage there is our ventral conca, corresponding to this. We don't need that, we are sweating, we don't need a cooling system like dogs and cats do need it. So, and we have such a simple system here compared to this system. And of course, dogs smell. They have an olfactory system. They have uh, olfactory mucosa that is closely connected to the brain and in, in a way part of the brain. And there is a, a special fast running system if they want to really to, uh, if it is very interesting, uh, they use this canal up here. If they sniff, the, the air predominantly goes through this short way and not through the ventral conca. So, if there are animals that have lost their nose, what, what happens with the lost nose or inside the rest of the nose? 
if we compare the, I must say, healthy dog, and we see the one important structure. Um, oh no, this was too fast. Sorry for that. And if you look at the, if you, I do it with this. If you look at these parts of the, tur of the turbinates, they are exactly those, but there's no space. So they have to grow around the corner backward and they obstruct the nasal exit. This is, please keep in mind, when we look back, in a, when we look at the obstructions in a few minutes. But concerning the thermoregulation and concerning olfaction, we have to say, okay, there is an area of olfaction and there is an area of thermoregulation. And this is more or less, if it is there, it is mostly that much obstructed that a normal thermoregulation is not possible in these dogs. And for a long time in my life, I thought, well, when they lose consciousness, if or if when they have very great trouble during summertime, it would be a question of oxygen supply. They can't breathe enough. But this is not true, or this is only part true in part. Uh, the, the main, main underlying cause for the, um, for the stress they, they have during elevated ambition temperatures is the more or less missing cooling system. And by the way, it's a proof why pugs are much more intelligent than German shepherds. Somebody looked at this panting and he observed dogs during a wide temperature range between minus 10 and 35 degrees Celsius. And this is um, ambition temperature and this is breathing frequency. And it is amazing that dogs keep a breathing frequency more or less constant from minus 10 to nearly 25 degrees. And then something starts, every, everybody that has a dog knows, they start to pant. What happens if the main cooling system does not work? We have animals that at least start panting at 15 degrees, and we have some, they have trouble above 12 degrees. We have several owners who wrote us, well, winter is a very, very difficult time because we, we have to downregulate the heating system in our flat and we have to, in the Germans say Norwegian pullover, they were very thick pullover, we have to wear them because we, we have, to, have to have it cold in, in, in the flat because otherwise our dog, our dog is not breathing nicely. So, let me stop with the, with the uh, thermoregulation subject and we, I would like to go down with you with uh, several slides or, or videos, uh, starting again at the tip of the nose, uh, demonstrating the problem of airway obstruction. Nary's is a topic you can, you can have a, an own conference on, on just on NARIs and, and the few millimeters behind that. So what's the difference? And where should we look at? And it's very simple to, to have a comparison. The healthy nasal entrance looks like a comma. And this is a slit. And what is, what, where is the most important part of the comma? It's the head of the comma. This distance here, this dis determines the amount of in-streaming air. You will see examples, or you probably know uh, from your own experience, 
that some dogs have also an opening down here, the, the tail of the comma. Uh, but unfortunately, this is more or less a blind Zach. This is not very reliable for, 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 for the airstream. So this is what we call the first stenosis. It's very easy. You can see it in each, more or less in each and every prosthophallic dog in a certain degree of severeness. But, and there was a, a, um, a very clear treating model for that, surgery described first time 1934, a wedge technique, I'll show you in a, in a second. And all of a sudden, that means 15 years ago, it started that the usual wedge technique didn't work anymore. Owners came back and said, well, doctor, you did that surgery at the nasal entrance, but..." No difference to me. And over the years, with exaggerated braiding for, for, for snub-nosed appearance, um, they developed a second stenosis, which we can see, or the situation we can see in the normal dog um, with, the, with some light and the naked eye. We see this bulb. And we can also see that this bulb is moving. They can ab abduct this, this, this bulb. Um, and in the brachycephalic animals, this is over the years, this bulb became larger and larger and more and more immobile. So it presses against the septum. And while the normal dog can do this during inspiration, it's just they try to, but they more or less, there is a second for the naked eye, invisible obstruction. So this is the first one, easy to see, difficult to see, and in brachycephalic animals only with the help of an endoscope or at least a very potent light source, we see that one. So the wedge technique we performed for 60 years quite successfully uh, taking out a wedge here and then opening this first stenosis. This doesn't have any influence on the second stenosis. So we developed, a, oh yeah, there's some, some examples. Um, it's unpolite, I'm always turning my back to you. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, so if, if you look at these different examples, I think it's, it's quite easy to discover the one who is, is breathing well. And there are some with these, well, they look like a nasal entrance, but you will see in a video in a second that this is more or less a blind sac. So they all have the same problem. They are where the comma head should be. They are obstructed. This one had somewhere, sometime surgery but didn't help anything. So this is, this is the important part. This is our blind sack. There's, this has nothing to do with the opening into the, into the airway. So this is our second stenosis, very tight, some moisture in between, um, attached to the septum, and in some dogs, really difficult for them to, to open at least a little bit. Behind that stenosis, the nasal cavity begins. So what is inside the nasal cavity? We already had an idea about this ventral concha. And what we usually see is, uh, this is a comparison of uh, an endoscopic view and uh, the CT situation. And we see several folds. We call that the five-fold view because there are two septum folds and three lateral folds, and they all have names. Um, and, but the folds are not, at that point, not, not, very, not the necessary things. The important thing is the space between, the airway. This is the airway, the in-streaming air. And I would like to 
take you down a normal nasal airway. This opening down here is where the tears are flowing from the eye. That's why we have to clean our nose when crying. This is the dorsal short way for olfaction. And this is this main ventral concave. And you, if you have a close look, there is no, no place where the mucosa touches the adjacent mucosa. And we try to go through this complicated structure very slowly with an endoscope. And this is usually the point where beginners say, well, it always bleeds, but if you Trained enough, it never or nearly never bleeds. This is the nasal exit. We already passed through the ventral concha. This is the wing of the Voma, and we look at one of the sinuses, the paranasal sinuses. Um, and we go back. This is the end of this nasal cavity. Here's the septum. The other nasal cavity comes from the right. We look into the nasal pharynx. Two very important openings up here. The auditory tube from the middle ear opens here. That's what, what we hear when swallowing. And we saw the larynx down there. Soft palate down here. There was an endotracheal tube, a large pharyngeal tonsil, very important for health. And when we go back, the septum starts again. The other, the way to the other nasal cavity, wing of the Voma, floor of the nasal cavity. They will go back within the next 12 hours. The lamella will go back into the normal situation. So this is how usually the air streams through a nose. And if we look into a brassophallic nose, we in many, many cases, we also see these structures we, we, we know from the healthy nose, but there are additional things to see. And this is more or less the situation. You're living in a 200 square meter flat with furniture all over, and then you have to move to a 50 square meter flat, and you want to take all your furniture with you. And this is the situation there. It must become very, very crowded. Um, and this is, we try to see these airways, but it's difficult to discover them. So again, the same video, the blind sac. This is the Frenchie. Um, this is our second, so the first stenosis, the second stenosis. And uh, when we are through, we should see something which should appear here. We should see the open airways and we see huge concha, malformed concha. They are also histologically malformed and there is a tight obstruction. This is a very worse dog. So this is not the average dog, but we see them more and more. Uh, and uh, especially in French bulldogs, we nearly have to, to take out, in a, in a large number of dogs, take out these obstructing concha. But we can, prove, we, can, we can diagnose this beforehand, and we see, is there other airspaces between? And if not, we know that we have a benefit from taking this out. Another situation we had a, a a, sm a, sh a small study where we counted the mucosal contact points. I told you two times that in more or less no, no place inside the nose there is contact between two surfaces of mucosa and we, we did a, a, a short study in counting them uh, as, and, and this is for us also a way to, to have an idea, semi-quantitative, um, how obstructed the nose is. We also measured in the two breeds with a very 
uh, yeah, a, 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 a very time-consuming technique, um, preparation before and uh, several measurements after another. This is the airway resistance in the nose of a beagle. And this, this had been our French bulldogs, and even worse, had been the pugs. So now we went nasal entrance, nasal cavity. We're going to the nasal exit. And again, I want to show you at first the situation in a healthy dog when we look in a, with the rhinoscope from the back into the nasopharynx. Um, oral cavity, soft palate, and now we look over the, the soft palate, the rear end of the soft palate, into the nasopharynx, and see this wide, wide airway. Here's the septum. I think we can skip that. And we do that in a pug. Pugs suffer more from these than French bulldogs, but it's nearly equal. And we see in sp instead of these two free holes that should appear here somewhere, didn't? No, they didn't. Yeah, now they do. And uh, we should see two empty. This is the nasal exit. And for resistance, it's, it's the same, same consequence. If the entrance is obstructed or the exit is obstructed, we see these huge malformed caudal apparent concave. Connected to the nasal exit is the nasopharynx. We already looked into um, a healthy one and now in uh, the nasopharynx of a prachycephalic animal. And here is a, a model that a Japanese ENT scientist, ear, nose and throat scientist, developed several years ago, and uh, which is perfectly true to explain the situation uh, in our dogs. So what he said, uh, we have a collapsible tube and through this collapsible tube air is flowing. This was this collapsible tube and we have a box around it and in this box there is meat. He called it. And uh, we can apply this. We see the we see the uh, the nasopharynx, the tube, this is our tube here, and this is the tube in the CT, more or less the tube, nearly. And if we have the box around are the bones of the jaw. We don't see all the parts of the box here, but this is the box around. And you can imagine the more meat is in the box, the smaller the tube becomes, or the smaller the box becomes, the smaller the tube is. And now the situation in Prachycephalix, and we see this is the remaining tube, and this is the remaining tube. And the box around, and all this is, as we say according to the model, meat. See, a huge, thick, soft palate, very thin here, and an argument to keep your dog, or to advise people to keep their dog in shape, also fat. One knows from man that only you losing weight improves the situation of snorers. So this is the meat in the box model. And also says why it is helpful to reduce not only the length, but also the thickness of the soft palate. If you measure soft palate, it's five millimeter in a 40 kilogram sh German Shepherd, and it's up to 25 and even more millimeters in, in an English Bulldog. If they put their head in a prone position, for example, for sleeping, this part obstructs and this is 
obstructive, this is a part of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, so they are intelligent dogs. Uh, uh, quite a number of them discovered that if I put something in my mouth that keeps my mouth open, I can breathe. The difference between our dogs and us is that we have even only a cold in, in, in autumn and the nose is closed. What, what do we do during sleeping? We open our mouth and breathe through the mouth. Our bed partner is not very delighted, but it helps. Dogs can't open their mouth voluntarily during sleep. They must wake up. And this causes the, 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 the trouble with the sleeping problems, that they have to get into trouble until they wake up and then they open their mouth. And then they sleep in again, close their mouth. This one, he managed it with this bone and slept perfectly. So we are approaching the larynx and we see the soft palate. We now see the soft palate moving. This is not a very thick one, but thin and long, and uh, even if we look into the larynx, there are other problems that we see. Try, try tonight in the bathroom and take a, a wet Q-tip and try to, to manage this area there, and it's quite an unpleasant feeling. So this, this is part of the snoring. Uh, typical snoring is done by, it comes from the vibrating, vibrating uh, soft palate. So there are other problems in the larynx that you already saw some slides this morning, so I can go, go uh, fast through that. The larynx is a very, very difficult, delicate area, and uh, so in more and more dogs, there is some, the mucosa is protruding, protruding into the lumen of the larynx. And uh, they have different names, laryngeal saccules. Um, we call them laryngeal seals. While it's more or less a break through the, uh, it's a seal, break through this mucosa. And we do surgery under a microscope, resecting them. And uh, just another dog with a edema around the larynx. But the worst development uh, concerning, the, concerning the larynx is the loss of rigidity in the cartilage. And this cartilage, and then we, we already heard this, this term this morning, um, laryngeal collapse. And uh, you see a part of laryngeal collapse here when it's so, so smooth that, that it is sucked in. This should be the normal situation. And if we look, this is one of the worst laryngeal collapse patients we had. This is more or less, it's more or less the consistency of chewing gum. It's just sucked in during inspiration. And the, the horrifying thing is that the number of patients we see with this problem is increasing over the last years. And this is very, very difficult to treat this. Um, and one should discuss whether it should be treated at all. Um, these dogs have such an obstruction that if you look at the abdomen and in a second, you see how much force he, he needs to inspire. And when he sits, you see him from the front and you see the forces that suck in the, suck in the, the skin here. He doesn't make very much noise because he, he can't manage to, to, to produce such an airstream that we hear the noise. But you see here the, the labored breathing he needs to, to, to um, to breathe. So there, I don't want to spend very much time with the, with the um, therapy. We can go fast through. We developed a certain technique where we don't only perform the wedge technique outside, but where we resect the 
inner part of the vestibule, the whole bulb um, under the microscope, and this gives a, a very open airway at this level. Um, I think the, the technique that is that has changed very much is uh, the resection of obstructing turbinates. And uh, we use a diode laser uh, that vaporizes, either in this case vaporizes, or resects total parts of the obstructing concave. And this is more or less a resection where we leave the Conca more or less in, intact, but we dissect the, the um, attachment, which is, a very, which is a, an invasive surgery. Um, but in, in the difficult cases for us at the moment, the only way to give them a relatively physiological breathing and this is the situation afterwards where we see uh, have a new intranasal airway. So I think we can go fast through the problem of uh, laryngeal collapse, but this is, for me, this is the one very intense um, and in a high frequency approaching problem for us that we see more and more. He's still alive, does not bleed at that, <laughs> that point very much. It's, it's not, not a dead dog. Um, and we resect all those parts that are sucked into the larynx. You, you see that here in a second. This is during forced inspiration. This, this um, tissue is sucked into the larynx and we, we resect parts of the, the tissue and then we apply attention to the lateral mucosa and uh, later on surgery always looks traumatic but uh, if, you, if you compare the results uh, um, prior and after surgery um, one can imagine that these owners felt quite a difference. So there had been there had been long long time ago there had been surgery the surgery was described there had have, there are several new techniques but when we look at this surgery we we see that while the multi-level surgery reduced the life-threatening events by 90% and uh, the incidence of sleeping problems decreased quite, quite severely and also the exercise tolerance. Heat, heat intolerance is still there even after a very um, a complete surgery. So further problems, yes, very short. You already saw the hypo trachea. This is a Dachshund. Imagine the same in a, in a French Bulldog. This is the French Bulldog in comparison. This is a Beagle. Imagine a Pug. This is really difficult to keep these teeth clean and they are, they are sentenced to have problems with bacteria because they, they are cleaned during the chewing process. They can't be cleaned. And middle ear, the Bulla tympanica in a poodle and in a French bulldog with very malformed bones. So I think we can skip this and a stop with the, with the lacrimal the drainage system from the eyes. This is a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and it is malformed like this in brachycephalic animals. So there is no chance from, for the fluids to, to flow passively from here to there. So I think we skip. I just want to show this problem of day sleepiness. Many dogs, or even, more and more dogs we see with the day sleepiness, they can't sleep at night, and this was 
in our kennels, and there, it was busy around. And he tries to, at least to sleep in a sitting position. So ways out of the dilemma, difficult point to talk about. I think we heard this, this was the beginning. We heard this very early in the morning. I'm a very, very hard colliding with these FCE breeding standards. I have to say, when, when you have in mind what I told you about the nose and the importance of the nose, I think breeding standards like head round, head broad and quadratic, which is more or less mathematically round, and head broad and square, which means the same. And you look at the old dogs and the new dogs, this was world champion, best of show, best of breed, best of whatever. No nose at all. Um, German judge. Um, this, is, this is something w really we have to, 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 to start think and to have to, 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 to start the dialogue that was mentioned this morning uh, to, do, to, to, to stop this development. So I'm personally, yes, we, we need more no's, but I may add it is for me even more important to leave the single beautiness for, uh, as, a, as a judgment in, in dog shows. We need to find ways to prove fitness in these dogs in the one or other way. And we will hear in, in, the, in a few minutes very, very interesting stuff about genetic tests and we have to keep in mind that genetic tests can't prove fitness. So we, we need both. We need the genetic tests, but we also need to have any, any um, um, judging points to where we can see how fit the animals are. And I think this is very, very difficult to speak that out, but also one has to think about the idea of pure breeding in the situation the prasophallic animals are at the moment. So thank you very much.